I ended up working for a Chinese-owned investment banking boutique that was doing tech stock deals on the mainland. And I got a window into China, particularly the tech side and the Belt and Road Initiative uh, that many Westerners didn't get. And I became both fascinated and alarmed at what China was doing. I came to the conclusion that most Americans vastly underestimated where China was going and what it could do, that it was becoming a true strategic competitor, and that its capacities in the tech space were beyond what we were thinking of. We tend to be dismissive of the Chinese as copycats rather than innovators, as technology thieves, as opposed to uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, that is a caricature that will serve us very badly in developing strategy to stay ahead of them if indeed we can. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by Nick Solheim, the COO of American Moment. You know, I was on the phone with someone the other day out in Los Angeles, and they said, is Nick still saying COO of American Moment? And I said, yes, he is, in fact, doing that. You're telling me now for the first time. For the first time. Um, We have a fantastic episode for you guys today with one of the great public policy minds of our generation. Today we had on David P. Goldman. But before we get to that, as always, be sure to go to AmericanMoment.org. There you can find everything that we have cooking as an organization, including the backlog of this podcast, upcoming programs, Foundations of American Statecraft, Fellowship for American Statecraft, AmCanon, which is our coalition of our collation of books, essays, podcasts, YouTube videos, short pieces, and more, as well as general news on everything we have cooking. The team is growing. Things are crazy around here. We're having a fantastic time. You can go find out about everything else that we're doing over there. As I said, this week we had on a fantastic uh, scholar, David P. Goldman, who's a Washington fellow at the Claremont Institute Center for the American Way of Life and deputy editor of the Asia Times, where he has written the Spengler column since 2001. He is also a senior fellow of the London Institute for Policy Research, and he previously was a partner at Reorient Group Hong Kong and global head of fixed income research at Bank of America and Cantor Fitzgerald. He was also a managing editor at Credit Suisse and Bear Stearns, a member of Institutional Investors All America Fixed Income Team, and was a Pulliam fellow at Hillsdale College college in 2017. His books include You Will Be Assimilated, China's Plan to Sinoform the World, How Civilizations Die, and It's Not the End of the World, It's Just the End of You. Uh, He writes frequently for the Claremont Review of Books, The Wall Street Journal, First Things, Newsweek, Law and Liberty, and Talo Magazine, and has published numerous scholarly articles on economics, finance, and intellectual history. David is one of the great, brilliant policy minds of our time, and we had a conversation about his heterodox views on the China question, um, the threat that China poses to modern life, and how um, he disagrees with some of our friends, like Elbridge Colby, on different constituent elements of how we approach that fight. Um, he's someone who spent significant time in that country, and so he really understands it very fully. I thought it was a fantastic discussion. Nick, what did you think of it? Yeah, it really made me want to, uh, especially the way he pronounced things, really made me want to learn Mandarin. I know I'm far too dumb for that, <laughs> um, but but no. You know a, way more languages than I do. Um, <laughs> a, it was a very uh, fascinating conversation. I always love these uh, foreign policy discussions, especially the, the caliber of people that we are uh, so grateful to have on and to talk about these uh, very large geopolitical questions. Um, there's certainly a tension on the right of center about um, you know, what we're going to do about China. And we certainly appreciate a, a kind of a broad uh, outline of the perspectives of different folks involved. Um, very fascinating episode. It's great. And look, if America and Americans are going to geostrategically compete with China, they need to be at top mental performance, which is why we are such big fans of Magic Mind. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see this little green shot. We've been drinking it with our morning coffee, and it really helps even us out during the day. I've been trying it for almost three months now, and I will say that um, I've tried to limit historically my caffeine to under one cup of coffee a day, uh, because at some point you can just escalate and be drinking 
an entire gallon like Nick used to and be a total mess. <laughs> so true. But at this point, uh, one cup of coffee plus Magic Mind, who uh, recently joined on as supporters of this podcast, really does help you drink it uh, in the morning, either with or without your coffee. And it really helps even you out, make sure that you can stay productive throughout the day. We work very long hours here at American Moment. And so uh, if you'd like to try out Magic Mind, you can get a discount on either a subscription or on a one-time purchase using our special discount code. You can go to magicmind.com slash quite unusual 20. That's magicmind.com slash quite unusual 20. Or you can just type in the discount code truth 20 and that'll give you 20 percent off your order or up to 56 percent off a subscription once again that's magic mind these little green shots that just make the day go a lot smoother we'll go now to david p goldman deputy editor of the asia times david thank you for coming on the podcast i'm honored thank you for inviting me we always like to hear a little bit about how our guests got to where they are today. I think your uh, background career-wise and personally is very instructive uh, in terms of, of explaining parts of your worldview. T tell us that story. How, how does one end up commenting on being an expert on the issues that um, you are today and, and what, what windy path did that journey take? It was a very uh, winding path. Uh, I started out as a journalist and consultant and during the early 80s, ended up doing odd jobs for the National Security Council. I worked for a gentleman named Norman Bailey, who was part of uh, Bill Clark's team at NSC, mainly doing economic studies. Uh, when Bailey was kicked out, with, basically with the whole first Reagan administration crowd, um, uh, I went to work with him as a consultant, and then uh, I joined the original supply-side consulting firm, Polyconomics. Uh, that makes me a card-carrying neocon by training, since <laughs> it was Polyconomics and, well, particularly supply-side economics, was very much a neoconservative project. And in that capacity, uh, towards the end of the 80s, since we'd already won in the United States, we branched out overseas and started doing country studies. So I spent a good deal of time on Mexico. I made numerous trips to Russia with a, with a business card saying that I was an advisor to the finance ministry, which a bit more complicated. But I found out when I got there is everybody was too busy stealing <laughs> to uh, be advised on economics. It was like advising the kids in the hoodies during the COVID uh, riots uh, you know, looting the stores on Madison Avenue. Um, and at a certain point, uh, I moved to Wall Street and I became the uh, global head of credit strategies at Credit Suisse and global head of fixed income research at Bank of America. In that capacity, I got to know China a bit because I had teams there reporting to me and customers there. So I made numerous trips to China. And after I quit before the 2008 crash, convinced that Wall Street was being run by uh, crooks and gangsters, <laughs> uh, cashed out my stock. And then in the early 2010s, some people who used to work for me started a boutique investment bank in Hong Kong called Reorient Group and asked me to join them. Uh, something I hadn't done before and it looked like fun. So... I ended up working for a Chinese-owned investment banking boutique that was doing tech stock deals on the mainland, and I got a window into China, particularly the tech side and the Belt and Road Initiative uh, that many Westerners didn't get, though of course there are many who did. Uh, and I became both fascinated and alarmed at what China was doing. I came to the conclusion that most Americans vastly underestimated where China was going and what it could do, that it was becoming a true strategic competitor, and that its capacities in the tech space were beyond what we were thinking of. Um, interestingly, in that capacity, I advised Huawei. I helped introduce them to the government of Mexico, 2014-2015. Uh, they ended up building a 4G uh, uh, mobile broadband network very successfully. 
I think I'm the only person I know who has both advised the NSC and the Office of Net Assessment uh, at the Pentagon, as well as Huawei. Uh, I have to say I prefer to advise uh, the American National Security Establishment than Huawei. I do not currently advise Huawei. Um, uh, but I did learn a good deal about the company, and I got to know some fascinating and extremely capable people. And I would say they're not to be underestimated in the slightest. We tend to be dismissive of the Chinese as copycats rather than innovators, as technology thieves, as opposed to uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, that is a caricature that will serve us very badly in developing strategy to stay ahead of them if indeed we can. That's very interesting because one of the elements of your commentary that I think is so interesting is um, you are quite heterodox to what feels like some of the emerging consensus in Washington on on the China issue. Um, and it's it's very clear that, that your perspectives here are motivated by original insight and observation. I think it'd be helpful for our audience to get a sense of, of how you see China um, in, in a couple of different cuts on, on the place. First, uh, its government. What is the Chinese regime in your assessment? Um, what's its motivations, its character? How does it actually operate compared to the sort of poli sci 101 version that we're talking about? Well, the Western institution that's probably closest in character to the Chinese government is the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that literally. <clears throat> The Chinese are communists in the same way that the mafia is Catholic. <laughs> oh, they take it very seriously, uh, but its practical importance is limited. China has always been, for 5,000 years, has been the bumblebee that can't fly. China was created by massive riparian investment in a river system in the Central Plain, which stretches for 8,000 miles, not including tributaries, just the Yangtze and the Yellow River basins, uh, to control the floods and support irrigation, you needed a centralized government and a centralized bureaucracy. So the emperor has always been a tax collector who picks off the smartest kids identified by competitive exams and aligns their interest with the central state against the provinces. It is not a nation. They speak 200 languages, uh, including dialects. Uh, people from uh, Beijing who go out to Chengdu in uh, Sichuan province can barely understand the locals. I've tried to conduct business meetings with both, with a Mandarin translator who couldn't understand the Sichuanese, not to mention Wandong or Canton, which includes Hong Kong, Cantonese is about as close to Mandarin as Finnish is to Spanish. So it is a very heterogeneous entity held together by an imperial tax collector and by infrastructure, always in danger of flying apart. So there's always been a centralized state, which is something like oppositely charged or similarly charged magnets held together by superglue. And when it gets a bad crack, either a national disaster, foreign invasion, it does fly apart. So the horror of any Chinese dynasty is the breakup of China. And from the standpoint of Xi Jinping, if Taiwan were to become a breakaway province and succeed in achieving sovereignty, lots of other people might get that idea, starting with Tibet and Xinjiang. So... The Chinese view uh, maintaining at least the fiction that Taiwan is a province of China to be an existential issue for the survival of the Chinese state. So relatedly, if the Chinese regime is about as communist as the mafia is Catholic. Uh, uh, but they are communist. Yeah. The mafia is Catholic. Right. But this is communism with Chinese characteristics. The Chinese really don't believe in anything. Right. They're the world's ultimate pragmatists. So how does the Chinese economy 
and its relation to the state actually work. Um, you have people in Washington on, on, I think, both sides of the extreme that are invested in this sort of totemic approach to the Chinese economy, that it's the dragon that can never be slain, or that it's all fake. I, 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 what, what should we make of the, the relative strength and composition and character of the Chinese economy? Well, there's always been a tension between the state's attempt to keep everything under tight reins and the natural anarchism of the Chinese people. Unlike the Japanese, who worship their emperor, Chinese never liked their emperor. He's the capo di tutti capi. He's, uh, he's a necessary evil. He's there to prevent the underbosses from killing each other because when they do, terrible things happen. That tragically happened many times in Chinese history. Um, uh, there's a wonderful movie called Back to 1943 about the Great Famine uh, in, uh, in Wuhan. Uh, it gives you some idea of the degree of suffering. So they don't like the emperor, but they consider him a necessary evil. Uh, the Chinese are among the most entrepreneurial people in the world. If you look at World Bank data on business formations, the rate of business formation in China is many times that of, say, India. Uh, once they're let loose, as they were by Deng Xiaoping in 1979 with the reforms, they go out and try to get rich because what they really want is uh, prosperity for their families. Uh, and they'll cheat and lie and you know, take bribes or whatever and try to get around the state, and the state will then come running after them. The capo doesn't like the underbosses skimming the skim, so you'll have periodic crackdowns. Uh, you also have uh, a 5,000-year-old tradition of investment in infrastructure, which in the days, the legendary days of Yu the Great with his magic turtle and magic dragon excavating uh, water management projects in the Yangtze River Basin. Now you've got the Belt and Road Initiative, you have massive investment in semiconductors, high tech, uh, the national 5G network, and so forth. So the good side of China has always been a very entrepreneurial spirit in the part of the people, which you see displayed uh, vividly in the Chinese diaspora in Asia and indeed around the world. They're terrific entrepreneurs and very strong government support for infrastructure, which often is very conducive to economic growth. On the other hand, you have a state which is inherently uh, paranoid, arbitrary, and tends to make blunders, which tends to trample over that. So that back and forth, the state needs the efforts of the Chinese people. Uh, but it doesn't want to let things get out of its control. So sometimes it will kill the goose that lays golden eggs. Example, Jack Ma. Uh, there certainly was a reason to be more cautious about Ant Financial's uh, risk management before its IPO. But the witch hunt that the Communist Party undertook against the tech sector, Jack Ma and his colleagues, certainly set them back uh, substantially. Uh, the anti-corruption campaign that Xi Jinping undertook, particularly against local governments, ended up blowing up the property market. Now, I don't think this is a 2008-style crisis. It's not a, a terminal problem for the Chinese, but it is a big speed bump. It certainly has affected consumption. It slowed their growth. So frequently, they oversteer or make arbitrary errors, uh, which hurt them. To the extent that you have a competent administration, and I, I, I do think that the administration currently is very competent. Someone like Li Chang, as the premier, uh, has uh, an excellent track record of working with private business, uh, particularly with uh, Elon Musk, for example. We can talk more about that. Uh, they will make corrections, uh, and they'll do some effective things, but then they'll always trip over themselves again. So they're not 10 feet tall. But neither are they a bunch of greasy communist apparatchiks running around killing people for fun. It's complicated. I've heard a lot of these comparisons, you know, that <clears throat> China is our, you know, modern day Soviet Union, um, which I think is 
probably a little off base. Um, you know, you've had commentators, members of Congress say things like that. How are the Soviet style communism and Chinese communism different? Oh, they're, they bear almost no resemblance. Communist Party of China has, I think, 93 million members, and it works like China's HR department. Uh, unlike the Soviet Union, where you rose through Communist Party ranks by loyalty, bootlicking, and being a good toady, uh, you have to be the equivalent of a national merit semifinalist to get a senior position in the Communist Party. Um, and there are performance reviews regularly and uh, 360 commentary by colleagues. They really try to pick out uh, competent people. It's much more like a corporate bureaucracy run by I mean, a relatively competent corporation than it is like the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. The Chinese also have no messianic view of themselves. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union was a messianic organization. It sponsored communist parties all over the world. It uh, organized subversion. All we have now is the Confucius Institutes at universities making, I think, very poor quality public relations for China. China is not interested in remaking world politics in its own image. If you ask the Chinese, they'll say, you're not competent to have a Chinese-style <laughs> government. You're not good enough. You let stupid people become uh, your leaders. And I'll say I'm an American, and it's my God-given right to vote for an idiot if I want. <laughs> I have, and I'll continue to. Uh, but they don't see it that way. It, it, you know, your, your choices are going to be uh, preset. So very different entity, very different civilization. Uh, Russia is based on the Russian language. You take people from all kinds of ethnicities and you Russify them. Dostoevsky's family came from the Baltic states, moved through the Ukraine, and then through Russia. Stalin was a Georgian. That kind of idea of forced Russification from the top stamps Russian civilization. The Chinese view is you learn the, to write the characters, you learn to wear Chinese dress and you pay your taxes. Otherwise, talk your silly dialect, dance your native dances, have your own festivals, worship your own gods. We just aren't interested. Don't tell us about it. Very, it, it, They're night and day. And I, I spent a good deal of time in Russia right after the collapse of the Soviet Union as one of the first wave of economists who went to uh, tell the poor savages how to conduct free enterprise, <laughs> uh, without success, I should add. Um, they couldn't be more different. Well, and surely the, the Chinese economy is a much bigger threat to us today than, you know, the Soviet Union's was at that time, right? Well, of course. I'm, to get a sense of what the, the Chinese economy is like when Deng Xiaoping started the reforms in 1979 and started moving farmers to become semi-skilled workers in cities, the rate of tertiary or post-high school education was 3% of the population. It's now 64%. China graduates more engineers than the rest of the world put together. And if you believe the US news ranking, uh, China has about half the top spots in engineering schools around the world. I have hired large numbers of Chinese engineers, and not just from Tsinghua or Fudan or Peking University, but from second-tier schools. Uh, they're very good. Uh, unlike many other people, the Chinese have a tradition of education. It comes from the Mandarin exams going back thousands of years. So you have a very hardworking, dedicated, disciplined, highly educated population that can assimilate and in some cases develop technology at a remarkable rate. And you also have a communist party that's willing to allow at least certain amounts of freedom to capitalist enterprises, which the Soviets never would. It's all top down from the Russian side. I'm very much a free enterprise guy. I think that individual initiative or 
collective initiative through corporations is much better than government direction. And the Chinese have allowed a great deal of that, which, of course, wasn't there in the Soviet Union. So culturally, what is the zeitgeist in China right now? How do you assess the, um, you know, the, the human ecology of the country? Um, I think we get a very distorted perspective on what that's like, or frankly, no perspective at all on what that's like in the United well, States. I was just at Huawei's headquarters in Shenzhen. They have a campus of 2,000 acres, which is quite a spectacular place in terms of landscaping. The R&D center, they have a little R&D city where 25,000 people work. Huawei spends $25 billion a year in R&D. That's roughly triple what Nokia and Ericsson, its two next competitors, spend together. Uh, and that R&D is conducted in a replica of European cities built to scale, uh, including a replica of the French National Library, a German castle, a French chateau, the market square in Heidelberg, um, because uh, Ren Zhengfei, the founder of Huawei, believes that art, beauty and art are conducive to creativity, and he wants his researchers to be creative. Uh, it, it's an astonishing, astonishing corporate headquarters. There's more uh, incorporation of Western high culture at Huawei's corporate uh, headquarters than any modern building in the world, corporate or public. Uh, there's something a bit creepy about it <laughs> because it's it's all imitation. Mm -hmm. Those buildings were built by people who believed in, in the sovereignty of the human spirit, not, uh, you know, goosing your IQ by a few points. But it's a whole lot better than nothing. Yeah. And you have 50 million Chinese piano students. So the zeitgeist in China includes... Try uh, cultural appropriation, as our woke friends say, trying to adopt the best in the West. There's also a lot of anomie. Remember, the people, the parents of the people who are now going to university, uh, lived in places with a dirt floor and an, and an outhouse without running water, and if they're lucky, they had a bicycle. Since those reforms per capita income in China has increased by about more than 25 times. So people do have a level of prosperity, which was unprecedented in Chinese history. And you certainly sense a spiritual vacuum. Uh, Beijing uh, is one of my least favorite cities in the world. Reminds me of being in, in an ant farm. There's something very... Uh, inhuman and oppressive about Beijing. Uh, but not all Chinese cities. Uh, Wangzhou, Canton, very relaxed, beautiful place. Uh, Chengdu, totally modern city. But uh, the Sichuanese are famously relaxed. So there are many different side guys in many different places in China. But if you ask me about the capital, I'd say there's something soulless about it. And one of China's great uh, questions is, how will the next generation find their spiritual needs? And that's that's that I don't know how to answer because everything's going in so many directions at once. Is it correct that the regime in China is trying to uh, bring back some sort of Confucian origination um, in its um, modern sensibilities? It it feels sort of propagandistic and, and I, retroactive. But. Yeah, I, I think that there's a Chinese propaganda, Chinese public relations next to British cooking <laughs> is maybe the worst product of the human spirit in all of our history. Um, the standard academic reading, which I think has a lot of merit, is that legalism, in other words, what the emperor says goes, the strict hard hand of the imperial state is tempered by Confucianism, which is filial loyalty. And Confucianism, for the most part, has been a fig leaf on top of legalism. So to the extent that Xi Jinping talks about Confucianism, 
it really does sound like the old fig leaf, which uh, goes on top of his legalism. How explanatory is Xi himself in understanding the modern Chinese state and the direction the country is going? Uh, you know, Everett Lutwak wrote a very interesting piece uh, a year or two ago observing that when Xi Jinping met Angela Merkel for the first time, he boasted to Merkel that he knew Goethe's great work Faust by heart. When Xi was a teenager, his father, who'd been a Red Army general, prominent person, fell victim to the Cultural Revolution. So he was exiled to the countryside. It's a miserable hamlet in the mountains. Uh, and the only book he had somehow got hold of was a Chinese language translation of Goethe's Faust. So he read it until he memorized it. Um, I think she has some depth. Faust himself, I mean, it's what, uh, Oswald Spengler talked about the Faustian spirit of modern capitalism in less than complementary terms. There's something Faustian about she. He wants to drive China forward into great power status and force the Chinese to embrace this greatness. So I think there is a definitely a Faustian character to him. But if you read his own stuff, it looks like it was uh, uh, written by bureaucrats on Xanax. <laughs> I, I've tried to, but uh, I, I can't read enough of it to get bored. It's just awful. So very hard to read him. Uh, someone like Li Chang, who was uh, Xi's sidekick going back more than 20 years, much more worldly, uh, as the party chief in Shanghai, he moved uh, heaven and earth to help uh, Elon Musk build the mega plant for Tesla. And now Tesla is the single biggest car exporter, now maybe number two, but one of the biggest car exporters uh, out of China. So you know, when you meet uh, Chinese uh, you know, I haven't met Xi Jinping, uh, but I, I have met senior people in the management. Many of them are very worldly, extremely intelligent, extremely relaxed. Uh, they're not the kind of people you would expect to be Communist Party functionaries. One of the names that, you know, enough uh, somewhat smart people have, have picked up on in the United States is this fellow, I think I'm going to butcher it, but Guo Wenghi. Um, who they call, you know, the Chinese Alexis de Tocqueville. Um, do, oh, do, yeah, that's, uh, that's yeah, Steve Bannon's buddy. Yeah. No, uh, no, uh, that's Miles Guo. Uh, Ma I, Miles I, Kwok. Yeah, that, that's a different gentleman. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Right. Go wing we. I know, I know who you're yeah, talking about. Yeah, sorry, they, yes. um, he, he, uh, he wrote America Against America. I mean, it's, yes. it, it, there's an effort, it feels like, in, in some American intellectual circles to do a version of uh, what was attempted to uh, be done with, uh, you know, ascribing Dugan as sort of the, the house intellectual of the Russian regime, that, that this fellow is the house intellectual of the Chinese regime. Do, do you think that's true? Do you think his, his work is not really that relevant? I don't think there, are too, I think there are too many key people to put your finger on one, uh, uh, one individual uh, who uh, I, I've met and have a very high opinion of is Wang Jisu. Uh He's the Dean of Foreign mm -hmm. Relations at Peking University. Oh, Wang Huning is the actual name. Yes, of the right. I was thinking uh, Wang, uh, Wang Jisu yeah. is another important mm -hmm. thinker. Remember, until the 2008 crisis, the Chinese looked at the United States in unalloyed admiration, wanted to emulate the United States. And then after 2008, I said, maybe these guys aren't doing so well after all. And if you read the, uh, the Chinese press and Chinese websites, uh, luckily with Google Translate and similar devices, you can now follow Chinese internal debate much better than we ever could before. Um, they are very critical of what's become of us. They point at our social problems, our political divisions. Uh, they've really moved away from admiring the United States to looking at the United States as a uh, declining power, uh, which is dangerous because it could lead them to 
overreach and be arrogant. And that's the kind of thing which can, under some circumstances, get you into a thing like a war. So I don't think it's good for the Chinese to feel too contemptuous of the United States. Unfortunately, many of the things they observe are issues which conservatives criticize as well. So let's get to the relationship between China and the United States. The conventional wisdom in Washington is that uh, great power competition is here um, and that there are a number of you know, military things we need to do. We need to reshore supply chains um, and we need to engage in sort of aggressive um, cu cultural battle with China and, and sort of try to remove some of their corporate influence as well. well what is your assessment of of the current state of Chinese U.S. relations and and where do you differ from this consensus of where we need to well, go? Well, militarily, we have the conundrum that it's extremely difficult for either of us to fight each other because we're very, very far away. In the 1990s, the American Expeditionary Force, the Pacific Fleet, could uh, steam an aircraft carrier through the Taiwan Strait and just tell the Chinese basically to shut up. Nothing they could do about it. Uh, that's not the case anymore. And my complaint about uh, some of the Taiwan hawks, uh, including my old friend Bridge Colby, is that the Chinese have made massive investments in anti-ship missiles, in fourth and fifth generation aircraft, submarines, electronic warfare, and so forth to defend their coast, satellites. And the current Pentagon assessment is that uh, the Chinese can basically hit anything within a thousand miles of their coast uh, on the surface <clears throat> with missiles, not much we can do about it. We knew that to the Office of Net Assessment 10 years ago when I was a consultant. And our biggest problem is that we have the equivalent today running the Navy of the battleship lobby that uh, in the 1930s and 1940s refused to recognize that their favorite uh, weapons platform had become obsolete. So it's the shiny toy brigade, like the, the aircraft carrier is the shiniest of all toys. And they no, want more I mean, we need to, now you can uh, you might be able to launch drones out of submarines or something like that, but you can't run an aircraft carrier. The Chinese, no, we have what I, I forget the number, something like uh, uh, I forget how many scores of thousands of soldiers forward deployed. The total number of Chinese soldiers forward deployed is 200. They're Marines sitting in Djibouti, whose job is anti-piracy and uh, civilian rescue. And according to the current Pentagon uh, uh, readout, uh, the Chinese have no intention to expand their Marine force. They probably will get a base in Cambodia. So they, they have now one base uh, in Djibouti, they'll have two. Uh, when the dust settles. But th what they have done is to massively invest in defending their coasts. And given the distances, it's very difficult for us to maintain control in that area and really impractical to defend Taiwan. The war games that you read are about you know, a Normandy-style invasion where you know, the Chinese come and landing craft and we've got the Taiwanese on the beach shooting them like in Saving Private Ryan. It's a ridiculous scenario. Chinese can simply blockade the island. They'll run out of fuel in 12 days. So uh, the Chinese also don't want to kill a lot of Taiwanese. They, they, they're Chinese. They want to absorb them. And they're also highly skilled. So... I think our ability to attack China is much less uh, than you know, war gamers like to think about. And of course, the Chinese don't have the means to attack us. So the good thing is it's very it's not like Athens and Sparta, who were right there with knives at each other's throats. It's very hard for China and us to actually go to war unless we want to shoot missiles at each other. But that's a bad idea because we both have missiles and we just blow each other to pieces. So that's the good thing. Uh, the problem we have is that if the Chinese are able to successfully project their economy into what they call the fourth industrial revolution, they like that phrase picked up from the World Economic Forum in, uh, in Davos, 
uh, we may end up like the north of England, a post-industrial, low-wage, high unemployment, second-rate form of power. And eventually, if our tech prowess stops pulling in money from around the world, then all of a sudden we might find it very difficult to finance our external deficits and internal deficits. We're $16 trillion in the hole to the rest of the world now. We've sold $16 trillion worth of assets, that is, over the last 30 years to pay for our excess of imports over exports. What would happen if tomorrow we just couldn't pay for it? Well, uh, living standards would drop in a big way. We'd have a depression. And how do we get that money in? Because people want to invest in America. If we cease to be a desirable investment location because the bulk of technologies move to somebody else, such as China, then we could be in a very, very big trouble. So I don't like the idea. I don't think it's a good thing or something we can sit back and simply let happen. On the other hand, when you have a country that graduates more engineers than the rest of the world combined, it's a real challenge to keep up with it. So there are kind of a whole host of solutions that get thrown around a lot from, you know, reshoring to um, you have some people saying that we shouldn't trade with China at all. What's the what's the answer to solving this problem? Well, politicians love things that are revenue positive or at least revenue neutral because they don't. It's very hard to uh, uh, appropriate funds these days. Reshoring sounds great, but uh, we actually did a study last April at Asia Times, which has uh, been repeated by the World Bank and by a number of other. Uh, groups, which basically shows that all that's happened with reshoring is China exports to Vietnam and Vietnam exports the U.S. China exports to Mexico, Mexico exports the U.S. China sends more intermediate and capital goods. The final assembly is done somewhere else. Basically, you're white labeling Chinese products and the politicians say, isn't that wonderful? We've reduced our dependence on China, but it's not true at all. China's presence in global supply chains is as great as it ever has been. So reassuring works if you're willing to spend the money. But we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars of capital investment in industry and a lot more worker training and a lot more infrastructure. We have to make public and private investments, education infrastructure, and capex to reshore. Now, Given how expensive it is and the fact that money is really tight, we do have a big budget deficit, we need to focus on those areas of excellence that we want to continue to dominate. And in my view, high-tech manufacturing should be critical. If China wants to send us uh, you know, circuit boards to stick in refrigerators, I'm not particularly worried about it. You need to be really selective to make this work because we simply can't afford to do everything at once, not practically. Um, tariffs didn't work particularly well. Uh, if we don't have the industrial capacity, people want something, they'll pay a higher price for it. Uh, so although I voted for Trump twice and I defended him in print many times against what I thought were scurrilous attacks on him, I thought his economic policy towards China, namely tariffs, was ineffective. I have argued that to uh, Robert Lighthizer and Peter Navarro. I just think it, it, it doesn't work. What I think works is the classic American defense-centered industrial buildup with the high-tech requirements of defense up front. We did that under Reagan. We did that under JFK with a moonshot. My friend Arthur Herman wrote a terrific book called The Forge of Freedom about how we did that in World War II. We've done it three times already. So we know how to do it. A lot of people say, well, we don't have the manufacturing anymore. We've done it with the labor, can't do it. Artificial intelligence, digitalization, allows you to leapfrog a lot of steps that used to take a lot more capital and labor than they do now. So the so-called fourth industrial revolution technologies actually make it easier for us to catch up. 
if you, for example, you need a part, you can program your machines to do that in a matter of seconds instead of having to call up somebody in China. Oh, we can't get it from China. Let's see if somebody in Brazil will make it. You can make things at home very quickly. So I think the old fashioned American way of doing it, which worked on three well documented occasions, is what we should be doing. And I want to be clear there's a free market component and a public component, which are easy to separate with a bright line between them. Let the government take care of infrastructure and basic science, let the private sector take the risk of commercialization. Under Reagan, we spent vast amounts of money on federal R&D, but the federal government didn't start any companies. All the new technologies were picked up by the private sector. So I think there is something to please free marketers in this and something to please the dirigists. I think both have a good argument. And the right way to look at it is the way we did it in the past with public-private partnerships. What do you make of some of what underlies these debates in Washington, which is a, a view that China is an imperial force across the world in a sort of conventional military sense. I mean, the, the way that people talk here in DC, you would you would not only assume that the Million Man Swim is coming to the coast of California, but that you know there there will be a Chinese imperial presence across the world. I mean, what what do what do people get wrong about what Chinese ambitions actually are? China has never had the same kind of imperial approach that we or the Russians have had. Its approach has been much more one of establishing suzerainty. They're the dominant power. People pay tribute to them. People acknowledge their primacy, but govern their own affairs. The Chinese have never been particularly interested in governing other people. Um, China's role in the world is much more powerful than we give them credit for. Uh, Look at the BRICS summit uh, last month. Saudi Arabia, Iran, and a bunch of countries are joining the BRICS group, which is really a China-centered group. China is the dominant economy in there. Brazil and Russia are massive importers of Chinese technology. And just If you just take one parameter, which China really dominates, which is mobile broadband, that's Huawei and ZTE in the, in the global south. They're the, the biggest providers. This is having a transformative effect on what Donald Trump, with some justification, called <laughs> countries. <laughs> and I did development economics you know, for, for some years, as I mentioned, with poly-economics and elsewhere. And what you find in the whole countries is that you have uh, rotten local oligarchs who control the local businesses. And you have about half the people who are off the tax rolls and in the so-called informal economy. And the local oligarchs treat them like beasts of burden. Nothing ever happens. Nothing ever gets done. And the Chinese come in and they don't have any claim on the local monopolies. They have to do something different that'll make money. So they build broadband. And with broadband, they bring in e-commerce and e-financing and all the other, what they like to call the ecosystem that goes around broadband. And what we observe, I'm writing a study of this for Journal of American Affairs, which will be out uh, in a few weeks. Once you get 60% or so of the population using the internet, you see an explosion of business formation. You've seen this in East Asia already, Uh, less in South Asia and not in Africa, because once everyone's got the internet, some person who did nothing but put a basket on her head and trudge to the market can find customers, can do electronic payments, can get information, can hire her neighbors. So in Africa, Uh, I was at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona in February. Huawei had a whole sort of a half a football field of telecom company representatives from the global south. And I I spoke to all of them. And there were Africans there saying, well, we've got to deal with Huawei. 
They give us all the location and payment information of smartphones, and they give us an AI algorithm. So that allows us to give microcredits to people because we know how much cash flow they have, and we know that they're actually going to the market. We can use the geolocation. So this transformative effect in the global south is what gives China power. If you look at the opinion polls, everyone in the global north hates the Chinese. I don't like them much myself. <laughs> but, you know, 70, 80, 90 percent majorities, China's bad. You go to the global south, it's flipped around. Big majorities like the Chinese because in Indonesia or Brazil or South Africa or Nigeria, or Ghana, the experience people have with what the Chinese have brought to them is extremely positive. Not because the Chinese are altruists, it's because to make money in places that were already occupied by the nasty local oligarchs, they had to actually add some value, whether they liked it or not. So the influence of China among billions of people is enormous. And we in the United States have tended to look at these places as baggage. They're foreign aid places. They, you know, we have to make room for them in Washington at the hotels once a year for the IMF and World Bank meetings <laughs> but, and in New York for the UN meetings, but we don't take them seriously. The Chinese take them seriously. And the longest, the, the biggest challenge to American influence in the world long term is China's ability to integrate billions of marginalized people into the world economy. We're talking about people going from making $2 a day, which is misery and degradation, to 10 or $15 a day, which is the beginning of dignity. And that is something we've really dropped the ball on. We were doing almost nothing in that area. We've ignored it. I've, I've written any number of articles complaining about this. Uh, I went to Mike Gallagher and said, please, you know, let's offer an alternative to what the Chinese are doing. But so far, I, I haven't, seen, uh, haven't seen much response. And that worries me. So the shiny object that American commentators will often fixate on in a environment like that BRICS summit is that there will be a new global reserve currency created out of a coalition of nations like that. Do you think that that is a present concern or is that a, a red herring for understanding well, what's actually it's, going on? It's not a present concern because the credit markets, the capital markets of those countries are too corrupt, opaque and inefficient and illiquid to support a reserve currency. You try to do trade financing in a local currency anywhere in the world. I'm a banker, remember. <laughs> uh, you'll tear your hair out. Uh, you know, you can pick up your smartphone app and, you know, send, uh, send money to anybody in dollars anywhere in the world. Uh, there would be an enormous amount of work would have to be done to make trade financing and reserve financing uh, efficient in local currencies. However, a two things have happened in the past two years, two really big events which affect this. One is the Ukraine war and the sanctions, and the second is the coordinated tightening of monetary policy by Western central banks. When, I mean, the old uh, adage is when uh, the industrial countries get a cold, the developing world gets a flu. They're back of the line for credit. If credit gets tighter, things are tough for them. The Chinese have become very important lenders to the developing world, which has buffered many countries against what otherwise would be the effect of a coordinated credit squeeze. It's also the case that because of sanctions against Russia and other people, it's worthwhile to incur the higher transaction costs and other annoyances of dealing in local currencies. So that's given a huge push forward to the technology, to the banking relationships, and so forth. So yes, there is a challenge to the dollar in the long term. It's not a short-term issue because those markets do backward. But we have seen for the first time that it's possible for this to happen in the future. And if we want the United States to be 
the dominant economic power and the dollar to be the dominant currency, the most important single thing is to make investments in the United States more attractive than other places. And that means improving our economy. We were talking about uh, earlier, you know, our inability to fight a war, you know, with China at, at great distance. Um, and we did kind of skip over the fact of like, what should we do <laughs> about Taiwan well, in particular? Look, in, to, Taiwan in the medium term is very simple. Uh, we all sign on to the one China policy, which basically means that Taiwan and Beijing have got to work out their arrangements. We do not play games which look like encouraging sovereignty. So, for example, having the Speaker of the House go to Taiwan from a diplomatic protocol standpoint is dancing close to the third rail because uh, constitutionally, uh, that's the number three in line to the presidency. So that, that gets the Chinese all upset. And it's a the United States is playing coy, saying, well, of course, we're not quite crossing the third rail, but we're letting you know we could. We don't play those games. The Chinese are not going to invade Taiwan if they think that it will eventually fall into their laps like uh, ripe fruit. So we continue to maintain low-key relations with Taiwan. We continue to send them a certain amount of armaments, uh, but we we basically maintain the status quo. What we should be doing militarily is figuring out how to shoot down uh, hypersonic missiles and dro how to defeat drone swarms, how to deal with you know, 50 ballistic missiles coming at a carrier. And maybe we abandon the carrier and do something else. The problem I have is that, you know, when, when Bridge Colby and other people to worry about how many 150 millimeter shells we have to send Taiwan because of all the stuff we've given to Ukraine. I think that's just the wrong way to think about it entirely. You can't defend Taiwan with conventional military technology. What's the next generation of military technology that we should be using? How do we defeat drone swarms? How do we defeat hypersonics? It's the parallel, you know, the, the global war on terror created the the energy behind the creation of something like iron dome which was different than anything that come before and like there's an equivalent of that for taiwan that is not at all relatable to existing military technology we used to spend more than one percent of gdp that's like two and a quarter trillion a year on the federal development budget that means like building prototypes now it's a quarter of a percent that's the problem I'm an old Reagan hawk. I, I believe in peace through strength. The problem we've got now is provocation from weakness. Yeah. So we just, and I, I wrote a piece for Law and Liberties entitled Two Kinds of Detente. And I said, Nixon was right to pursue detente in the early 1970s because we couldn't win a war Again, with the Russians and the Central Front. They were too powerful. So the right thing to do was pull back, uh, stall for time, and build new kinds of weapons. That's what we did. We invented the digital age in weaponry. Smart weapons, uh, new, the modern avionics, all these things came out of the 1970s and 1980s. And then we won the Cold War. I want to be military, militarily stronger than China, but I think a lot of what comes out of Washington is braggadocio from a military establishment that's been building the wrong kinds of weapons to fight a China that exists 20 years ago and is covering a <laughs> that's my that That's my reading of the quality of the debate. One of the things that people bring up time and time again when they're trying to say that there there's threat inflation with regards to China is that their military is completely untested in in a conventional warfare environment. Do you think that that matters? Is, uh, are, are all of their guns going to make a whoopee cushion sound the second they're shot on a well, battlefield? <laughs> What's going to well, happen? That, that's, that's a very difficult question. Uh, the Chinese, the People's Liberation Army is like this character from a horror movie with a gigantic head and a 
you know, spindly, tiny little body. The PLA as a land army is one of the worst trained, worst equipped armies <laughs> in the world. It's a joke. Uh, the PLA spends, uh, last I checked, I think $1,800 to equip a soldier. We spent about 20000 Now, what's $1,800? It's a rifle, a helmet, and a pair of boots. Change a uniform. Um, we also value each each individual soldier much more highly. Well, true, but you know the Chinese don't seem to have done anything with their land army. They have a mediocre tank. They're, they just don't have very much. Uh, they don't even have any ground attack aircraft. But the Chinese have a pure interceptor. We have built a pure interceptor since the Starfighter, I think, uh, in the in the nineteen fifties. Uh, it has no cannon. It's only there to stop, to defend the Chinese coast. And they've got a thousand fourth and fifth generation planes. How good they are, we really don't know because we haven't fought them. I hope we don't find out how good they are. Uh, but we know that their missiles are extensive and they're very good. And they've got plenty of um, diesel electric subs, which make about as much noise as turning a light bulb on. So... Their capacity to defend their coast should not be underestimated. The rest of their army is backward, and that's a good thing, because since they haven't built up much, by the way, of land forces, they don't have much sea lift capability, uh, it does not look like they're planning to invade anyone. They've got, uh, th I think, uh, total 30,000 Marines. Last I, last I checked from the Pentagon sources. What do we have? Including reserves, 180,000. They have 12,000 special forces. We have 75,000 special forces. So Chinese have not been putting money into the kind of things that would be the spearhead of foreign intervention. Not according to any source, including the Pentagon, that I've seen. They have invested massively in coastal defense, including electronic warfare, satellites, the whole kill chain. And that I would not underestimate. What's stopping them from um, blockading Taiwan now? I mean, is it primarily uh, just knowing where, you know, President Biden stands on well, Taiwan or? Well, there would be terrible consequences <clears throat> if they blockaded Taiwan. We would blockade them. We might cut off their oil, then they cut off oil to Japan. Or Taiwan, I mean, it, it, or or Korea, this could escalate very nastily and be terrible for everybody. And one thing the Communist Party of China wants to do is keep its people prosperous, and this would cause a depression in China, probably in the whole world. So the price they would pay for taking any kind of military action against Taiwan, and they have blockaded it for a day or so by running exercises, which are effectively a overnight blockade, but no real blockade, uh, we'd make them pay a price, even though it would cost us, it would hurt everybody. So unless they feel they have to, I don't believe they'll want to pay that price. And the critical issue is uh, t uh, Taiwanese sovereignty. Can they maintain the fig leaf that Taiwan is always going to be part of China, that sovereignty isn't an issue? Uh, the trick for everybody is simply to leave that off the table and let us do what Reagan and, in fact, Jimmy Carter before him did, rebuild our military technology. I know that you have your uh, preferred scenario as it relates to Taiwan, but what do you think is the most likely outcome over the next decade or so? Well, there's uh, a terrific book published a couple of years ago by Admiral Stavridis called 2034, about a nuclear war that erupts over Taiwan. Nobody wins. The Indians end up mediating between the United States and China after we each destroy a number of each other's cities. So that could certainly happen. <laughs> God forbid. And it's something to worry about. Uh, the most likely scenario is that we all back off because when it comes down to it, if the Chinese are not poised to invade Taiwan, and I don't believe they would unless they felt we were about to push independence, um, there's no reason for us to take 
provocative action, we can both back off. It's not like Athens and Sparta. I mean, Graham Allison did write a good, a useful book, the, the, the Thucydides Trap. But remember, Sparta was terrified the Athenians would send aid to their helots, the slaves who supported them. And the Athenians were terrified the Spartans would aid rebels in the Delian League, which was supporting them financially. It was very easy for either Athens or Sparta to hurt the other in a very serious way. Much harder for the Chinese and us to hurt each other. So I'm, I'm less I, I'm less convinced by the Peloponnesian War examples than uh, some of my colleagues. One thing I was thinking about recently is that it used to be the case that there was a a a greater distinction between the concepts of foreign policy and defense in American policymaking. Um, uh, and it feels like, especially on the right of center, that an appreciation of, of diplomatic ability has really eroded over the last um, couple of decades. Um, the conventional wisdom is that the Chinese have diplomatic ability in spades and that they're using it to great effect across the world. Do you think that's right? <sighs> I don't think Chinese diplomacy is particularly effective. Um, I've seen them commit enormous blunders uh, in in many venues, uh, and it, it the saying in Beijing is that if you have a, a stupid brother-in-law who needs a job and he's not good for anything, send him to the foreign ministry. Uh, they've never taken they've never put a a great deal of importance on diplomacy. Where they've made enormous strides is with economic diplomacy. They've, they've spent a trillion dollars on Belt and Road or more, either in loans, direct investments, and so forth. Now, compared to the $8 trillion that we spent on the forever wars, that was probably <laughs> a better investment. Definitely. Uh, China now exports more to the developing world than it does to all the advanced markets combined. It's doubled its exports to the developing world. That's the main source of its growth. And if I'm right that the development of broadband and other infrastructure is going to help increase the growth rate of the economies that China is working with, that certainly has in Asia, then that becomes self-sustaining growth, a major source of support. Uh, China knows that at some point we're not going to be a, a dumping ground for their excess capacity. We're going to have to manufacture more. They can't be that stupid. We need to. We can't afford to keep borrowing money to pay people for it. So China's going to have to find other markets. Those markets would be in the developing world. So you know, they've done a pretty good job in Indonesia, I have to say. Indonesia has had historically some very difficult relations with China. 1965, when uh, Suharto was overthrown, uh, sorry, Sukarno was overthrown, uh, there was a massacre of Chinese. Nearly half a million Chinese were killed. Um, but now uh, Indonesian Chinese relations are excellent. Uh, Huawei is training the whole government in cybersecurity <laughs> and building out their broadband and they're building a high speed rail from uh, uh, in Java. So uh, yes, they have had some successes, but I don't think Chinese diplomacy is particularly good. And their ability to address the United States has been you know, just awful. So final question. Uh, one of the elements of your commentary that I think makes you so compelling is that you're prescient. You, you pay attention to things that, that the other people in the American commentariat are not. Um, what is that thing right now? What is the thing that you're paying attention to that no one else is? Where's the alpha that, that you have right now? I think the key issue is the so-called fourth industrial revolution, the application of AI. Uh, you know, I went to uh, Shenzhen that spent two days interviewing Huawei executives about the details of what they're doing industry by industry, factories, mining, railroads, warehouses, ports. I visited the Tianjin port, which is one of the top 10 ports in the world, completely automated run by AI algorithms directing giant cranes through 5G and autonomous vehicles. Well, just astonishing. 
things. Now, these are early days yet, and what we're seeing are advanced prototypes that have not yet been mass adopted, but they could be adopted very quickly, in which case China will be, the, without any question, the world's dominant industrial power. We have vastly underestimated what the Chinese are capable of. And what I and my colleagues in Asia Times have tried to do is to report in detail, in a very granular way, on what these technologies are, who's developing them, what they can accomplish. Uh, and I've seen very little of that in other American media, conservative or otherwise. So subscribe to Asia Times. <laughs> I was just going to ask, David, where can people keep up with everything that you're writing, thinking, Asia, and saying? Uh, AsiaTimes.com, though I'm privileged to also write for the American Mind, the Claremont website, Law and Liberty, and some other venues. Wonderful. And people can follow you on Twitter as well. That's right. Um, thank you so much for uh, uh, coming today. This is just pleasure. a fascinating thank you. discussion. Thank you. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. I could listen to David talk for hours and hours and hours and hours. He is a wealth of knowledge. He's got this just fantastic way of talking. Um, when he uh, quoted uh, former President Trump, that was quite delightful as well. <laughs> I just thought it was a fantastic discussion. And the China issue is one where there will be a lot of groupthink in Washington in these coming years. And if we are actually going to solve the problem as opposed to create an eco chamber where you know, dumb platitudinous ideas are circulating around all the time. It's important to constantly sharpen, as iron does iron, um, how we're thinking about the challenge of China. And David is, I think, one of the primary voices speaking sense on that issue, and by no means the only one, but an important perspective in that fight. Be sure to check out all his work, especially at the Asia Times and at dc.claremont.org, where he does stuff for Claremont's Washington Center for the American Way of Life. Be sure to check out the backlog of this podcast at americanmoment.org. Be sure to rate and review it five stars thank you guys as always for listening thank you to magic mind for supporting moment of truth and we will be sure to see you next week moment of truth is an american moment studios production filmed at the conservative partnership center our podcast is produced and edited by jake mercier and jared cummings our intro music is a minor struggle by ryan serenich don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.